It's about the long, happy marriage of the writer Gertrude Stein and her wife Alice B. Totless. I wrote it, my second biography, in the late 1980s, before lesbians existed. <laughs> Back then you didn't use the word unless you wanted to make your mother hyperventilate. <laughs> Gay marriage was when the bride and groom danced a jig in the home counties. <laughs> and clitorises were some sort of secateurs, some like the gardening implement, like secateurs. And some of you weren't even a gleam in the turkey based as I. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> So Gertrude and Alice, here's a description of them. They were a strange-looking pair. In photographs, they look like a double act of little and large. Alice is always carrying the bags and umbrellas or sitting in the lesser chair or wa walking behind Gertrude or is scarcely visible at all. But she fostered this image of the self-effacing maidservant and it belied her force of character and true role in their relationship. She had a cyst between her eyebrows, which Picasso said made her look like a unicorn. To hide it, she combed her hair forward to the bridge of her nose and pulled her hat down to her eyes. She was under five foot tall, and when sitting, her, her feet seldom reached the ground. She loved expensive gloves and, and took great care of her hands and nails, which she manicured daily. And she had a moustache which the food editor of House Beautiful, Poppy Cannon, in 1958, said made other faces seem nude by comparison. <laughs> she had grey-green eyes, a large hooked nose, and an acute sense of smell even, and taste, even though she was a heavy smoker. Gertrude was large in girth, though not in height. In her prime, she weighed 14 stone. She liked loose, comfortable clothes with deep pockets, and wore sandals even in winter with fronts like the prows of gondolas. In 1926, she asked Alice to give her a haircut. Alice didn't know how to go about it, so it got shorter and shorter. And the shorter it became, the better Gertrude liked it. By the end, she didn't have much hair left. Ernest Hemingway thought she then looked like a Roman emperor. <laughs> that was fine, he said, if you liked your women to look like Roman emperors. <laughs> Though neither Gertrude nor Alice ever wore trousers, their appearance could confuse. Gertrude, particularly in evening clothes, was sometimes mistaken for something ecumenical, a bishop or a cardinal. <laughs> At Christmas 1934, when they were staying with Gertrude's cousin, Julian Stein, in Baltimore, one of his children, aged three, said she liked the man, but why did the lady have a moustache? <laughs> They first met in Paris in, on the 8th of September, 1907. Alice heard bells ringing in her head when she saw Gertrude and thought that proof she was in the presence of genius. On Gertrude's suggestion, they walked alone together next day in the Luxembourg Gardens and ate cakes in a patisserie of Boulevard Saint-Michel. From then on until Gertrude's death, 39 years later, they were never apart. They never travelled without each other, or entertained separately, or worked on independent projects. Gertrude felt low in her mind if she was away from Alice for long. <coughs> and Alice, writing about their long relationship at the end of her life, said that from the moment they met, it was Gertrude Stein who held my complete attention, as she did for all the many years I knew her until her death, and all these empty ones since then. They became intractably related to each other. They called each other pussy and lovey in front of strangers. Alice was pussy. <laughs> they wrote notes to each other, inscribed DD, darling, darling, and YD, your darling. They regarded themselves as married. Alice often called Gertrude he, or her husband, or her baby Woodjams. She gave her a cut out hand colored paper annunciation in a gold leaf frame, inscribed my husband is mine and I am his. And in her love poems, she made many a reference to the joys of conjugal life with Alice. Little ba Alice B is the wife for me, she wrote, or tiny dish of delicious, which is my wife and all, and the perfect ball. 
or you are my honey, honeysuckle, I am your bee. Of course, they weren't married in any contractual sense. There were no civil rights or legal recognition. But they were truly married in their hearts and minds and shared life. And what prompted me to write their story all those years ago was the irony that while so much was on record of failed heterosexual literary marriages, this story of two lesbians was a beacon of success. But I'd never have dreamed that a couple of decades after publication of my book, a revolution would have happened, created by the same momentum as inspired their shared life. An unstoppable groundswell of change that turned into an avalanche for millions of lesbians determined to be silent no longer, to come out, speak out, be true to ourselves. It's been a real social change in my lifetime, and I'm pleased to have added my voice. And I was pleased when just three weeks ago, after the US Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriage was a legal right across the United States, the New York Public Library put on a celebratory display of LGBT material from their collections, which included a picture of Gertrude and Alice with an excerpt from my book. But I'd also add a caveat. I'd also add my voice in support of dykes like me who don't want to marry or divorce, <laughs> who don't want contractual relationships, and who don't want married lesbians to be seen as the good ones and the rest of us as less wives and spinsters. I'm a spinster. <laughs> but writing lesbian biography was my way of coming out. In the 80s and 90s, I wrote quite a lot of them. Um, I called them Dyes Dykes. I wrote about Glark, a society painter who chose that name, wore stylish mannish clothes, rebelled against her family, fell passionately in love, and painted fine pictures. I'm pleased that in 2018, 30 years on from when I wrote that book, the Brighton Museum is planning to put on an exhibition about her, and they aim to call it Gluck, A Lesbian Life. In 1988, I wouldn't have found a mainstream publisher who would have allowed me that title. Mind you, it is Brighton, and who knows if it wants to transfer to Clacton. <laughs> I wrote about the tortured love life of Radcliffe Hall and the ludicrous suppression of her novel, The Well of Loneliness. I wrote about Violet Trefusis and her mother, Mrs. Keppel, and the hypocrisy, hypocrisy of a society that vilified Violet while openly lauding Mrs. Keppel, who was mistress of the king. I wrote about Natalie Barney and Romaine Brooks and all those wonderful lesbians in Paris in the first half of the 20th century, who, with their writing and publishing and patronage and lifestyles, made the modernist revolution happen who show that revolution can happen if enough people have the dream. But the happiest of my dyke biographies is Gertrude and Alice. They were at the cultural heart of that Paris revolution and intrinsic to it. And there was a moral base to their relationship. As a student at Harvard, Gertrude had been entangled in a fraught, triangular relationship with another woman. She described herself in that affair as trapped in unillumined immorality. She wrote, if you don't begin with some theory of obligation, anything is possible and no rule of right or wrong holds. One must either accept some theory or else believe one's instinct or follow the world's opinion. They accepted a theory of obligation. They fell in love, saw life from the same point of view and lived as a couple with much emphasis on domestic harmony until parted by death. They were happy and they said so. Their deepest point of agreement and the focus of much of their shared life was that Gertrude was a genius and that she and her genius must be served. It takes a lot of time to be a genius, Gertrude said. You have to sit around so much doing nothing. <laughs> she liked to lie in the sun, write for half an hour, look at paintings, meditate about herself and life talk to people, walk the dog, basket their large poodle, drive the car, auntie, which was a Model T Ford. Anything else made her nervous. Alice did the rest. She was always fiercely busy. She could knit and read at the same time. She typed Gertrude's manuscripts, carried her bag, did the knitting, sewing, housekeeping, dusting, ordered up the library books, supplied etymologies of words, references to poets, 
corrected Gertrude's French, kept the house filled with honeysuckle, roses and tulips, answered the telephone, did the filing, and served all meals promptly. <laughs> when they went on holiday, they took lots of holidays, Alice did the packing. She is very necessary to me, my sweetie. She is all to me, my girl. I think the main components of this happy marriage were sex, food, art, and friends. Gertrude, as a writer, broke all rules of grammar, syntax, and narrative. She loved endless repetition and did things like having five chapter sevens or page eights coming off page 53. <laughs> It meant she stacked up unpublished manuscripts. Publishers returned her work with bewildered or caustic rejection notes. They thought perhaps she had an imperfect knowledge of English or had been eating cashish. <laughs> In these manuscripts, she wrote a great deal about the joys of sex with Alice. As she put it, when all is said, we are wedded to bed. She described one of her stories, which she called a book concluding as a wife has a cow, a love story, as her Tristan and Isolde. Cows, Stein scholars tell us, are orgasms. And here's a bit of Gertrude's Tristan and Isolde for Alice. Have it as having, having it as happening, happening to have it as happening, having to have it as happening, happening and have it as happening, and having to have it happen as happening, and my wife has a cow as now. My wife having a cow as now, my wife having a cow as now. My wife having a cow as now, and having a cow as now, and having a cow now, and having a cow now. My wife has a cow and now, my wife has a cow. <laughs> Goes on for some pages. <laughs> Tell your cow day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> <laughs> Food like cows was extremely important to Gertrude and was a large part of their marriage. Everything to do with sorting it was Alice's domain, of course. In the menu, there should be a climax and a culmin cul culmination, Alice wrote. There's a lot of climaxes and culminations. <laughs> Come to it gently, one will suffice. Throughout her life, she collected recipes, and her cookbook remains a classic. She served her hard-boiled eggs with whipped cream, truffles, and Madeira wine, stuffed the duck with beef fat and chestnuts, stewed the apples in rum, flamed the bananas in kheer. One of her snacks called for eight egg yolks, three cups of butter, and a cup of whipped cream. For their Saturday salons, she made a punch with a sweet, innocuous taste, but which packed a terrific wallop. She served it with little spiced sugar biscuits. So it wasn't surprising Gertrude was on the large side. <laughs> Art was another component of this happy marriage. Gertrude had inherited money, which allowed them a lifestyle that was hospitable and extremely comfortable, but not grandly affluent. The cost of living was low in Paris, and they never owned property. But her true fortune was acquired through love, her collection of modernist paintings. She bought them for the most part with her brother Leo before she met Alice, usually from Ambroise Vollard, the art dealer whose shop was around the corner from their apartment at 27 Rue de Fleurou. She called them the treasures of her youth. Their spending limit was 300 francs a picture, and the unknown paintings they liked just happened to be by Picasso, Matisse, Cezanne, Gauguin, Degas, Braque before they were known. She never insured them, and usually she didn't frame them because she thought frames constrained them. She just stuck them on the walls and Alice dusted them. <laughs> People wanted to see these strange modern paintings, and that's how Gertrude's Saturday evening salons began. Picasso and Matisse became friends, and they brought their friends, and so the evening snowballed. While Gertrude talked to the artists, Alice sat in the kitchen with their wives. She said she would write her memoir and call it Wives of Geniuses I Have Sat With. <laughs> <laughs> in the 1920s, Gertrude showed more interest in the work of innovative writers than painters. And Sylvia Beach, who founded the bookshop Shakespeare Company, said she felt like a guide from a tourist agency because so many aspiring young American novelists visited her shop and asked her to introduce them to Gertrude Stein. 
encouragement from Gertrude shaped careers. Ernest Hemingway, Scott Fitzgerald, Paul Bowles were very much helped by her. But an underrepresented fact about the modernist revolution that took place in Paris was how intrinsic to it expatriate British and American lesbians were. Sylvia Beach defied the British establishment by selling from Shakespeare and Company Radcliffe Hall's sad novel, The Well of Loneliness, when it had been banned as it's seen in this country in 1928, and by publishing James Joyce's Ulysses. Natalie Barney aspired with her Friday afternoon salon to make Paris the sapphic centre of the Western world and used her salons as a showcase for artistic innovation. Jane Heap and Margaret Anderson founded the magazine The Little Review and were among the first to publish T.S. Eliot, Hilda Doolittle and Amy Lowell. Then there was Briar. She was born Winifred Elliman, but called herself Briar because it's one of the Silly Isles, and it was there that she fell in love with the poet Hilda Doolittle. Briar was the daughter of the richest man in England, Sir John Elliman, and to appease her parents and gain her inheritance, she married a gay man, Robert McCalman, and with him used her money to set up the Contact Publishing Company, which between 1922 and 1930 published Gertrude Stein, Juna Barnes, Hemingway, Ezra Pound. It's hard to see how modernism would have flourished or even taken off without the creative energy, imagination, generosity, and patronage of these lesbians. And now there's something comparable going on here. There's been contributions in the vanguard from the poet laureate on in film, writing, theatre, music, with content that sloughs away the old orthodoxies and the havoc and denials they cause. I think the indomitable outness of Gertrude and Alice links now to then and then to now. And the lesson of their love of life isn't a bad one. They love driving around, looking at paintings and Roman ruins, eating delicious food, talking to everyone, having a good time wherever they went. They practiced the art of enjoyable living in a non-pretentious way, and they were so emphatically and uncompromisingly themselves that the world could do nothing less than accept them as they were. Thank you. Thanks for all